Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Welcome back, everyone. My name is Tim, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Tim. Well done, those of you who are still awake, still alive. Um, so, step five. Um, I've taken step five a number of times. Some people are of the happy experience that they've only needed to go through the first nine steps once, and that's fine. Uh, footnote, we all get to have different experiences in AA. Uh, no one has to explain their experience. <laughs> Just have to say what our experience is. And if your experience is different than mine, that's fine. It doesn't mean someone's right and someone's wrong. It just means you have your experience, I have mine. My experience is that I've had to do step five more than once. Um, I did step five when I was um, a few months sober back in 1994. But um, I build up clutter in my mind over the course of the year. I'm going to do a bunch of things I'm not very proud of. Um, Over the years, over the last 20 years, my life has got bigger and bigger and bigger. And let's go back to the first time, though. Um, my first step five wasn't a big deal. I had, as I said earlier, I had five sheets of paper. And all I had to do, my only job in my step five, was to say what was on the pieces of paper. And there were all sorts of terrible things that had happened to me uh, in my life, which I got to talk about. There were all sorts of terrible things I've done, some of them in response to the terrible things that have been done to me, sometimes off my own bat. And what was amazing about my step five, the actual process was very simple, you just talk. What was amazing to me was that the man in front of me uh, was unimpressed by the whole thing. <laughs> He wasn't shocked. He wasn't disturbed. You see, I told parts of my story to helping professionals. Now, when you tell your story to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist looks troubled, (laughs) and they start immediately writing notes and making recommendations, you know you're in serious trouble. (laughs) So you have to start to backpedal and... uh, minimize before more drastic action than you had anticipated is taken. Um, So with my behavior when I was sober, before I ever drank, and certainly with my behavior once I was drinking, I got perilously close to having more supervision by the authorities than I wanted. So I would find ways, as soon as I was getting anywhere near near the truth of pulling back, and, as I say, minimizing. Now, with this bloke, I could absolutely let rip. I could tell him absolutely anything, and he would look slightly bored. He would look out of the window. He'd stop me mid-sentence to ask if I wanted another cup of tea. (laughs) And at the end of it, he said, Do you want pizza? (laughs) Now, this didn't solve my problems. Because we don't solve each other's problems. Um, If I ever, by the way, try to solve any of your problems, please just back away slowly. (laughs) Um, Don't let me near you. I told the truth and had someone else hear it without any kind of judgment. And that did a lot. It, It put my problems into perspective. Um, in step six and seven, um, 
I'm not a big 12 and 12 person. The 12 and 12, in case you don't know, is the affectionate name for the book, The Twelve Steps and the Twelve Traditions. And there's lot, lots of amazing, amazing things in there, which I just think are wonderful, and which I don't think we read it nearly enough. The stuff in Step 12 is gold dust. Um, but the stuff in Step 6 and 7, I've tried to, I've tried to make it help me, but it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, I like what's in the big book. Which is, I have no big book. I don't have it memorised, but that's fine because that's why they wrote it down so I don't have to have it memorised. <laughs> we have emphasised willingness as being indispensable. As we now, are we now ready to let God remove from us all the things we have admitted are objectionable? Can he now take all of them, every one? If we still cling to something we will not let go, we ask God to help us be willing. Um, already that's almost too complicated for me. The way I view step six is this. It's terribly simple. Um, Quite, this is the question in step six. Do you want to stay like this? Do you want to remain this unhappy for the rest of your life? And there are only two answers, just to make things even something. Yes or no. <laughs> if the answer is, no, I don't want to stay like this, then everything is up for grabs. And just to ring fence what everything means. Anything I think or anything I do. Those are the only two levers that can be pulled in my life. I've spent my whole life trying to pull the lever called my emotions. Trying to directly affect my emotions with people, with drugs, with alcohol, with circumstances, with money, with sex thinking, if only I can get the combination right, I will change how I feel. And the truth is, if I want to change how I feel, I, my thinking needs to change and my actions need to change. Now, the funny thing is, my actions can't change unless my thinking, at some level, changes. So the only problem I ever really have is my thinking. So when I say to God, I don't want to stay like this, what I'm really saying is I'm willing to have every single attitude in me changed. I'm willing to have every single behavior pattern changed. I'm willing to have every single thinking pattern changed. Now, this seems very frightening until you realize that your thinking patterns, your attitudes, and your behavior are not you. And this is what I got out of step five. I said everything that went on, and I realized that everything I had been describing was not me. I was, all my thinking patterns have been taught to me, all my behavior patterns have been taught to me, they're not me. So I can get rid of all of those without changing who I am. Because there's nothing wrong with who I am, it's the tools I've been using which are wrong. So, and I'm perfectly happy, it talks in, we agnostics, that we're, we're perfectly happy to get rid of an old gadget which doesn't work and replace it with a new one. And my thinking, my attitudes, and my behavior are just old gadgets, so I don't need to hold on to them any more than I would a radio which doesn't work, or a computer which doesn't work, or a car that doesn't go into reverse. Um, and that makes it a lot easier. The other thing that I love about this, it's we let God remove from us. So I don't have to do, I don't have to make change. <laughs> which is really, because how would you even do that? I have to be willing for the change to happen, but I don't have to make the change. What I do have left is uh, five steps. If I want my thinking to be changed, if I want my behavior to be changed, I have five other steps which will do it, which we're going to talk about a little later. But my, my step seven is effectively to say to a power greater than myself, um, show me a different path to walk down mentally and in action. 
And that is it. Then the other, the other five steps will flesh out the detail of what that path is. That's what I've got in those three steps. And now, Laura. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> yeah, these three steps, things started to change for me here, too. My step five wasn't as nearly as scary as I thought it would be, but uh, I showed up at my sponsor's on the appointed day with my step four in my hand. I re- can't remember how many pages of my cahier de bouillon were filled out, but not too many. And all I did was read it. Um, I do, I, I listened to step five basically the way my sponsor did with me, and that is we go over the first, we share the reading of the first few pages of this chapter into action. And then we get to uh, 75 where it says we pocket our pride and go to it. And that's what I did. And my sponsor didn't say very much. <clears throat> I tried to be as honest as possible. There was the question at the end, had I left out any secret that I would had vowed to take to the grave? And sometimes we do that uh, in our group. Sometimes we do that at the beginning. And I really didn't believe I'd left anything out. But my sponsor had to clarify a few things in column four. I tried to be very column four as laid out in this book, which is not in a column, but anyway. But my character defects, which are listed on page 67. Selfish, self, uh, self-seeking, dishonest, fearful. And my sponsor had added one, which isn't in black and white in here, but it was called Plain God. <laughs> He said, you know, if you have a resent, especially in resentments, if you had a resentment against someone, you couldn't put your finger on what your defect was. He said, put plain God, and we'll talk about it later. Well, that's uh, that's that comes under the third step. You know, it said we had to quit playing God, but at the time I didn't understand. And I found out I've been playing a God a God a lot in my life. But I tried to make sure my effort at being thorough was to look for those things everywhere. And I found them everywhere. All the character defects, everywhere. You know, but he listened. And the one thing I could not bring myself to write on paper on my step four was the dishonesty. Because I couldn't see it in myself. I, you know, I've been lying to myself for so long. And my sponsor helped clarify that. Every time it called for dishonesty, I wrote down delusion. <laughs> you know, and, uh, after that step five, I was able to see my own dishonesty. You know, and later on, I realized it was my own ego trying to save. I thought I had thought I'd been trying to save face with other people all my life. I've been trying to save face with myself. My own ego was trying to protect itself, which the joke was on it or me, because I was still attached to my ego. But step five, uh, you know, it's a little more than a confession for me. Um, to me, this program is all about humility because I do have an illness of the ego. It's about humility. And it was by grace I got the humility to even be able to go through these the first time. You know, but step five had a lot to do with it. Had a lot to do with it. But once I had done my step five, yeah, my sponsor wasn't too impressed. My sponsor also, maybe because he was a young man, maybe he thought it, I don't know. But he was kind enough to share a bit of his own experience and let me know that he had done some of the same things, had some of the same thing, you know. I don't know if it was necessary, but that's the way it happened. And I tried to do that too a little bit, but not trying to fix people, just to keep us on the same wavelength. And... uh then I was told to go home, take this book down from the shelf. That's the last, that's the part of this instructions for step five. You go by the book and sit quietly for an hour, which is what I did. And I felt so bad about seeing myself for what I really was, selfish, self-seeking, dishonest, all that stuff. You know, I could have gone one of two ways. I didn't feel like taking a drink. 
But I did feel like uh, changing my life because I had already got the idea in step three that maybe with this program, my life would change. And I'd heard often enough that it's not me that's going to change my life. So I was to go home, sit for an hour, carefully considering these things. If I had left anything out of my step five to ring my sponsor right away, I didn't think I'd left anything out, so I proceeded to... um, Step six and seven, that very easy. And it's very clear, step six. I don't want to really bore you with repetition. But it's so simple. My grand sponsor says, read the black bits. Don't read between them. Don't overcomplicate it. It really is just read what it says, the black part, not the stuff in between. And I have... and. I'm going to share this, not to be judgmental, but I've learned just as much from, in meetings from things that aren't in this book or people that may not be working the program as I have for, from people who are doing it <laughs> in a way that works for me. And I've I heard for years on and off people seemingly stuck on six and seven for years. Now I know they were probably bothered. But very often I hear people on step six, uh, they're looking for their character defects. They use step six to look for their character defects, the things that they have admitted. But this says the things I have admitted are objectionable. So luckily, doing, and I'm not trying to sell this really, I know, I know it worked for me. I understood through step four and mainly five, but face to face with another alcoholic with something greater than ourselves in the room, I understood that those things were objectionable. And I understood that my character defects were linked directly to whether I would drink again or not. You know, I just knew that in my guts. So step, step six. And for, for a couple of years to myself, I called this a baby step. Maybe it is a baby step. <laughs> because, of course, the Oxford group had, had uh, five or six steps, you know, half the number we have, that, where, where AA came from. But it is an important step. I mean, if you're not ready, you're not ready. But uh, luckily, luckily, luckily I was, you know, I figure I drank enough for ten lifetimes. <laughs> and I hope uh, I never forget that. So I proceeded to step seven which is a simple prayer. And and I'm talking about the first time I went through this, and I haven't you know, really done it again, I, except I do it on a continuous basis. I have to do this on a continuous basis. Remind myself who I am and who is in charge. But, you know, I don't just... So step seven is on 76. And uh, on our program today, we have Into Action and then more action. But this is an amazing chapter, Into Action. It's not into thinking, into talking. It's not even into meditating, which seems to be a favorite activity amongst us. But uh, and this really accelerates. We've got four steps on this, you know, four, three and a half steps on this page. And seven is a simple prayer. You know, my creator, I'm now willing you should have all of me, good and bad. You know, I can't just give the bad parts to God and then go my own way with what I think is good. Because remember, I asked, I promised in step three, that God would take what was left of me and build with me and do with me as he would, you know. Every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. So I'm asking God to remove the defects. That means I leave it up to God or whatever power there is. I just use God because it's a short, simple word. Um, it's up to this power greater than myself which defects will be removed and when. Because sometimes I can use my character. You know, and that's another process of letting go. I found in a lot... This is a big process of letting go. Letting go. I had to learn how to let go. 
And of course, grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. I need to pray for strength a lot. Often I need. Mm. Mm. And then I've completed step seven. It doesn't take a long time. Once I'm ready, it doesn't take a long time. And then we're going to do eight and nine, right? Um, then I have, oh, it was pointed out to me, and it's just a way of reading this, that step seven, if you'll notice, it ends with the, the word amen. It was pointed out to me that step three plus step seven, they can be taken together as one prayer. But they have this interlude, you know, of steps four, five, and six, especially in the first time through, but any time. You know, I'm asking God to remove me of the bondage of self in step three, but it doesn't have ha- happen overnight. You know, I've got to put in some of the footwork. I've got to see where bondage of self is causing me trouble and the people around me. I started to care about the people around me and the trouble I caused them. You know, and this is the continuation now that I've done my part. So step three, I ask God to do his part, and I do some of my part, and I come back to, come back to God. So, this really isn't as complicated as we make it. But all I know is I needed to do this, uh, with a sponsor. You know, had I done it, tried to do it on my own, I don't think it would have worked. I can't really say because I didn't try to do it that way. I tried not to do it on my own, but, uh, you know, I need AA and I need to be surrounded by people who are uh, doing the same kind of things. So thank you for being here. She's good, isn't she? Um... Steps eight and nine. I was just looking at the French edition here, and sometimes people get very hung up on particular words. Uh, and I was noticing in step eight, uh, in the French edition, it says toute la personne que nous avions lésé. And later on it says toute la personne que nous avions uh, offensé, and then que nous avions blessé. <laughs> so it uses three, it uses three different words. Um, and I tried for a long time to analyze intellectually what does harm mean and what I do when I take step eight now in any form and this is slightly heretical because it's not quite in the book so if you only want want to do what is in the book then get some cheese and stuff the cheese in your ears right now for the next five minutes Um, the way I do step eight is uh, I do three columns and in the first column I write what action I took And in the second column, I write what action I should have taken instead. And in the third column, I write who suffered and how. And the reason I find this helpful, um, if you grew up in a family like like mine, you'll have been told that all sorts of things were your fault which weren't your fault. You'll grow up with all sorts of... um, guilt and shame for things which were actually other people's stuff. And I needed to do a really clear step eight where um, there were there have been actions I've taken in my life where other people suffered as a result, but I don't I don't own them any because it was the right thing to do. And this method of step eight clears out all of those situations all of those situations where you do the right thing and temporarily someone else is going to be upset. I mean, a silly example, this isn't something that would end up on my step eight, but I, I have to mark exams. and I, I, My job is to fail people their university degrees where necessary. And I have to make the final decision. If I make the final decision that someone gets 45%, that's the end of their degree. Uh, now people are very upset about this and you know make threats and whatever. They're very very angry. Now just because I've upset someone doesn't mean that I've done the wrong thing. There are times I've had to let people go out of my life because I don't want to watch them die anymore. And they hate me. There are people, there are times I've had to tell the truth and people hate me. So just because someone else is furious 
or weeping does not mean I have harmed them because the alternative may have been worse. So that's why I'm very clear in step eight. What did I do? What should I have done instead? And only if there is a gap between the two do I answer the third question, who's suffering now? And this is this has made things very clear for me. In step nine, um, one of my difficulties over the years, and this is a big debate in AA, uh, is what does it mean when it says we make amends to those we have harmed except when to do so would injure them or others? Because there are very different schools of thought and there are certain amends where I've gone to different people and I've got different feedback back on whether I should make amends, whether I shouldn't make, shouldn't make amends. And my first time round, as I say, wonderful people, but they were very conservative about making amends, so there were all sorts of situations where I didn't go back to the person, I didn't go and have the conversation. And what I've done over the last few years is I've used what's in the book, and it's made things a lot clearer. And when I read pages 76 to 83, it gives lots of examples of how to make amends and when to make amends and when not to make amends. And there are three principles which are in there which can be summarized under the heading except when to do so would injure them or others. The first one, it talks about our, our main purpose is to fit ourselves to be a maximum service to others. And linked to this is this idea we don't want to be hasty and foolish martyrs. Um, the second one, it talks about not revealing, essentially not revealing new information. So the example is that the wife that uh, knows one has been unfaithful but doesn't know the details. And should we convey all of the gory details? And the book says not always. <laughs> Uh, and the third thing is it's very clear we don't involve other people. So those are the principles I take into making amends. Um, I don't reveal new information. I don't, and I, I've had experience of people making amends to me, and they start the amend off with, I've hated you for many years. And, okay, now, I'm so pleased you've got over that and you've now forgiven me, but I really didn't need to know. I didn't need to know the depth of your feeling. And, I, and if you've done mean stuff, I don't want to know why. I don't want to know your mental backstory or motivations. I don't care. Just sorry, I shouldn't have done it, and then we'll have a fight. We can go on. So new information, be very careful. The don't involve other people, absolutely. Uh, that should be very clear, but the, I need to fit myself to be of maximum service. Uh, there was one place uh, that I stole from when I was drinking, and my father had got me the job there, and the decision was made that, that there was no way the place could have uh, known that I was stealing tips. I was waiting that they couldn't have known I was stealing tips. Um, the last thing that would have helped anyone's relationship, it wouldn't have helped my relationship with the institution that I worked for, it wouldn't have helped their relationship with my parents, when my father was the mayor of the town in question. Um, if I had revealed this, no, one, no one's life would have been improved. I would have undertaken a heroic act and got egg on my face. Now, the money wasn't mine and I needed to give it back and I found a way of returning the money. Um, but I'm not one for heroic gestures. On the other hand, um, I hear an awful lot in AA, don't go back to ex-partners, you've heard them enough already, and they don't want the past being raked up. I'm afraid the whole principle behind making amends is raking up the past. Uh, it is, by nature, going back to people who've suffered. Now, the truth is, if they're over it, you can't hurt them. If they're not over it, all you can bring up is pain that is still there, working 100% of the time below the surface. When I'm not healed of something, it's a mechanism operating in me, dictating and con conditioning my behavior the whole time. When I make amends, all I'm saying is I was wrong. I shouldn't have taken the action that I took. I regret the harm that it caused. I've never, and as I, as I say, people made amends to me for stuff where I was still hurting. 
I had never been harmed by someone saying I was wrong. And so if you're walking on an amend, ask yourself, have you ever been harmed by someone else admitting that they were wrong and regretting the pain that you're going through? And I can't think of a situation where, when the tables are turned, but the book tells me to turn the tables, turn, look at it from the other person's point of view, put yourself in their shoes. And when I've suffered at someone else's hands, those are the only two things I want to hear. I shouldn't have done that. Um, I'm sorry you suffered. And then we can be friends. That's all. And so I did go back to all the exes uh, that I was told or suggested not to go back to. And this was now years later. And the funny thing is, with every single one, um, they tell you things that no one else can tell you because no one else was there. People say the past can't be changed. That's true. But the past, in as far as it is alive in me today, is my perception of what happened. If my perception of what happened can be changed, well, the past can be changed. The past, as it lives in me, can be changed. And two stories in particular about amends. Um, there was a relationship I had when I was 14 to 18 with someone who's older. It started off as an abusive relationship with me. The other person had the power in the relationship. It started off very abusively. There was lots of mental torture, effectively. Um, in the last year of the relationship, I turned the tables and did everything I could to destroy this person. Now, what he did in that relationship was unconscionable. But that doesn't make what I did back right. Um, almost everyone in recovery told me not to approach this person. This is someone who has form as well, who has damaged a lot of other people that some of whom I've been close to. So this is someone that everyone agrees is not, uh, not, a, not a healthy person. But he didn't present a physical threat to me, you know, at the age of 30-something. Um, when they do, you know, amends can be made over the phone or with someone um, watching carefully so that you can, you can be safe. But I had a conversation where I didn't mention anything that he had done wrong. I didn't rake any of that up. I just said, look, in the last year of the relationship, I did this, this, this. I did, I did, you know what I did. But this is the thing. You're only telling them what they know. It's not like you're going to surprise them because they were there. So I talked about how um, I tried to turn other people against him, ruin his reputation, ostracize him. And I said I regretted deeply what I did. Now, I've been told my whole life, oh, Tim, we love you, and you're one of God's children, and blah, blah, blah. I never believed any of it. I mean, I believed it intellectually as an intellectual proposition, but I never believed it at gut level. And what this bloke said to me was we loved and hated each other in equal measure. Now, I knew he had hated me, but I hadn't realized that he had continued loving me at some level, despite all the torture, emotional and mental torture. I didn't realize that everything I did in retaliation had not affected or damaged or dampened that. Now, somehow this taught me at some level that whatever I do, I, there is nothing I can do to stop you loving me. And this is why I can harm people. If, when I harm you, you stop loving me, that would be the end of the problem, but it's not. And this is the God residing in everyone. Um, I'm just going to tell a little um, diversionary story. Um, and I get this from a friend of mine in recovery. He talks about, I'm not very religious myself, he happens to be, and this is a religious story. So, again, if this bothers you, just put cheese in your ears for the next five minutes. Um, he talks about the burning bush in the Bible. So Moses is walking along, he sees this bush burning, and, you know, as you would, you start talking to the bush. Um, now, this may not be odd for any of you, I, but 
the odd bit is when the bush starts talking back. <laughs> and he, sa- he realizes that there is something supernatural going on here. And so he asks the voice in the bush, who are you? What's your name? And what he's expecting is a name. And in religions of the time, if you knew God's name and invoked God's name and sacrificed a goat, then you could get that God to do whatever you wanted that God to do. So it was transactional. And he said to this voice, what are you? What is your name? And the voice said, well, literally in Hebrew, it's I am who am. Now, that gets translated in traditional texts as I am that which has always been and will always be. Now, I don't connect to either the the short form or the traditional translation. There is a modern translation of this. So this is God speaking to man and saying, no matter what you do, I will never let you go. And I can relate to that as an idea of power greater than myself. And what I understood from making amends with the people I've harmed, no matter what I did, in their hearts they never let me go. Another amend, I was unfaithful to someone and hurt him very badly. And then we broke up. And when when we broke up, he said to me, if I ever see you again, I'm going to kill you. And so, of course, everyone said, don't go back, don't go back, don't go back. Um, I found him. Uh, I've been looking for him variously over the years, but I only found a contact address. The moment I was doing my step eight, suddenly I looked again and he was there on the internet. So I found him and I wrote to him and I apologized. I was a neurotic wreck in a relationship. I was, I was manipulative and abusive and, and, I was unfaithful and I admitted it and we broke up. And so I made amends for this and I've been taught to say in amends, uh, is there anything else I've done that has harmed you that I haven't mentioned? And he said, oh yeah. <laughs> so you grab something, <laughs> wooden, um, and I said, what? He said, it took me ten years to get over you. I have no idea the harm I have done to people, not because of the harm that I did, but because they loved me and I didn't know. And this has been this has been the story all along. If you want to change your perspective of your past, go back and find everyone. And even for a twenty franc note I stole from where I was living um, at the age of eleven, tiny little things doesn't matter how big the rip in your mind is. It doesn't matter whether it's a tiny thing that happened 20 years ago. If it's still hurting, it's still hurting. If whenever they talk about honesty and integrity in a meeting, a roll call appears in your mind, it doesn't matter what it is. Go and find them. And I can't tell you, if you haven't experienced the ability to go anywhere in the world and not be frightened of who's going to pop up in front of you, uh, I wouldn't miss that experience for the world. So uh, I recommend amends for changing your perception of the world so that you don't have to resort to drink to do the job for you. That's what I've got. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. That was great. I never heard that way of doing step eight, but I think I might try it next time. But it's true, I can't, uh, I can't hold myself responsible sometimes for other people's reactions to who I am. To thine own self be true, right? So steps eight and nine, faith without works is dead. So I saw, as I said, in step five, um, four or five, how horribly I treated other people. And I started to get an idea of how I had hurt them. And I used step eight to get a little more clear, this is the first time, which is what Tim did, to get clear on what I needed to make amends for. 
and to whom I needed to make amends, and where they were. Uh, one of the ideas that was presented to me was to keep a little set of index cards of every single amendment on my list, but a sheet of paper, a notebook, and cross them off successfully. successively. And um, you brought up an idea. The first time through, I thought I had big amends and small amends, but there's really no difference. It's only in my head. You know, each person that I've come in contact with in my life, and probably I've hurt every single person I've ever been in contact with, and I have not made amends to every single person I've been in contact with, but each person's a human being, and each person has this, you know, this intrinsic work. It doesn't matter whether I think he's a big man or a small man, they're all worth the same amount. But amends is about me getting to be the right size. It's about humility. It's about a lot of prayer and willingness. Because, of course, the first time, I didn't want to go to these people. I really didn't. But it has a reminder here on page 76 at the end of the paragraph on step 8. Well, the reminder about prayer. If we have the will to do this, we ask until it comes. But, yeah. And remember, it was agreed at the beginning we would go to any length for victory over alcohol. Later in the chapter, it says, we agreed that we, we remind ourselves we are willing to go to any length to find a spiritual experience. You know? And in the beginning, I thought I was doing steps to stay sober, which... I am, but I'm also doing this to clear away the wreckage and all the barriers between me and a power greater than myself, which amounts to the same end result so far I've stayed sober. The one thing is I had to be, you know, they talk about willingness, and uh, I had honestly started in step four to understand that I had hurt other people. Because throughout my drinking years, I didn't, I thought, and even in my early years in AA, I thought that I was the only one I was hurting. <laughs> I thought these people around me, especially those closest to me, you know, my, well, my father had already passed on, but my mother, who was far away, but it was my mother, my husband, my own daughter, you know, I thought they were big enough to handle my behavior. I was just so out of it. I was on planet Laura. That's all. That's where I was. But I had started to understand, in, in uh, and of course through the meetings, how uh, these people around me were, were human beings, and I had hurt them. And, and part of that was coming from coming from trying to put myself in other people's shoes, <laughs> which I hadn't done very much in my life. You know, trying to stay out of judgment in AA using the idea that I couldn't judge someone unless I'd walk a mile in their shoes. But I started to understand that, you know, the, the top people on my resentment list were my mother and my ex-husband, the king and queen of my resentments. And little but slowly, I started to realize that they did what they had did, done that were on my list because of what I had done or because of their own character. I mean, my husband, you know, it was all about the way he treated me, but, I mean, he was scared shitless by my behavior and my drinking, and he was also very, very hurt. Very, very hurt. And in fact, I understand, I'm pretty sure now, uh, for a long time he took a, I was a shameless drunk. He's the one who carried all the shame. Is that fair? Hardly. Hardly. But I did start to get a little understanding about other people. And it's probably going to take me the rest of my life. Because I'm selfish and self-centered. But this chapter, Into Action, it contains some very specific instructions about Step 9. And uh, 
The step, step nine says we need direct amends to people wherever possible. You know, I, I had the great good luck in my first couple of years of recovery to be at like four big book meetings a week. <laughs> And so I got this drilled into my head, you know, there was no avoiding it. And uh, I had the gift of desperation, so I, I, try, I tried to listen the best I could. And they said, direct amends. They had invented the telephone already in Phil's day. He walked into the, the bar to telephone, right? And he said, you know, if you've heard these people, the least you can do is go down and buy some stationery and watch some post office buy a stamp and post a letter. So, you know, I got the idea. No phone calls, no emails. But, you know, these things, all I know is they need to be worked out with another person because my best thinking <laughs> is not always the best best thinking available. I needed to work it out with another person. So lots of consultation with my sponsor and or mentors, people on the same path, most of my sponsor. And there's specific instructions in these eight pages or so. I haven't counted them recently. You know, financial amends, owning up to some criminal offense. I heard a story over in Houston when I was about three years sober about a woman who'd been seven years sober in AA or something, and she was coming up for trial. There had been this horrible car accident when she was drinking with friends, and everyone in the car died except her. But she had been in blackout that night because of drink and drugs, and after careful consultation with the people in and around her, she decided, number one, to tell the truth. <laughs> but she realized that she could have been put in jail. She said, I cannot honestly say I was not at the wheel of the car. And since there was no one else left the blame, she ended up going to prison, you know, for several years, because she could not remember. And she was okay with that, but it was an amazing story, amazing story about, you know, rigorous honesty, you know, admitting that she could not say that she did not do that. Um, but anyway, back to my amends, my experience, um, yeah, the criminal offense, the and not involving others. So this is why I need to put, you know, my head together with another alcoholic and sort of double check whether I'm going to ca cause harm to others. You know, not to be the hasty and foolish martyr. Because my best thinking, you know, I may end up involving someone else or hurting them. And then there's a story in here about the man who made public amends. And when he stood up in church, the reason, do you know why he made public amends? Because he had done public harm. This is the way it was taught to me anyway. But I saw that in action in our own intergroup <laughs> some years ago. And um, some people had a problem with the way one member was operating. You know, one member was just operating, carrying the message in, not his own way, but as best he could, he thought, following the book. And uh, so, some people uh, took exception to the way he was telling the truth, you know, to alcoholics, like, about the deadly illness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But they decided to gang up, up on this man at an intergroup meeting. And one by one, you know, they had written testimony and da 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 da. It was like a lynch. It was like a lynching, a public lynching. I hope I'm not upsetting anyone. Put the cheese in your ears. It was horrible. And I think they realized sometime during the afternoon what they had done. And one by one, behind closed doors, you know, behind, they came and said, oh, sorry, maybe we're a little up. But they never apologized to the people in the room in front of whom this man had been slandered, you know. But that's the whole idea of the story on page 80, you know. If I've, if I've gone around uh, slandering someone, ruining the reputation, I may need to clear his name with the people I've wounded. <laughs> Did that happen to me? I don't think so. Although, I engaged in that type of behavior, but I, I tried not to do that anymore. 
And most of the time, I don't. But that's all, that was all about me being insecure and ego-driven. And if I have to put someone down, it's because, you know, I don't feel good about myself. It was all ego. But once God takes away my ego, I don't, I don't have to do that anymore. And this is the thing, too, you know, in amends, if you haven't done your amends, you'll probably be worried, ambivalent, diffident, scared. It's so true on page 78, you say, in nine times out of ten, the unexpected happens. And that's because I'm expecting the worst. You know, but the story, the story where the man me, the gentleman me, public amend, stood up, admitted his wrong. It takes a big person to do that. It takes a big person to do that, but we get right size. That's what humility is, being right size, not too big, not too small. But um, he grows by this, but it says his action, admitting this, this horrible wrong in public, his action that widespread approval. Because it was the right thing. It was the right thing to do. Right? And now, admitting that he had done this horrible thing, he is one of the most trusted citizens of Pakistan. And it's not surprising. Because this is a very rare thing these days. And I know myself, I tried to be a good person my whole life. And when on my own power I couldn't be a good person, I tried to brush my mistakes under the carpet. I tried to pretend they never happened. And that didn't help me because they I pressed them down in here, you know. They stopped it. And I realized, as I said, I had only been trying to save face of myself. I realized in the end all the rest of the world had seen me for who I really was. Or at least they'd seen my behavior. I was the only one who didn't see it. So I needed this to own up. But it does say, and as Tim said, you know, a sincere, a sincere desire to set right them wrong. So I was told to knock on the door, explain what I thought I had done wrong, ask what the other person, well, actually, ask what the other, had I left anything out? Was I un unaware of something I had done that hurt the other person? And finally, to ask what they needed from me to repair the damage. I can't fix them, but I make an offer because it does say in here, you know, a man's is more is about setting right the wrong. And it says there are some wrongs I can never fully right. You know, there are many wrongs I can never fully right. But if I make the offer, um it's a sincere effort to set right the wrong. But I can't say. I'm the one who did it. I can't say what the other person needs. You know, I have to stay away from playing God. And, uh, so many things that are written in this chapter have happened for me, but sometimes I'm, it's not satisfying. For, for instance, I was sincerely ready and willing to make amends with my ex-husband, but he's not really a touchy-feely kind of guy, and he caught me off really short. You know, sometimes a man we are uh, calling upon admits his own fault. You know, so he just he just sort of said, it takes two to ruin a marriage and got up to leave almost, you know. So that was quite unsatisfying. And uh, I wrote him a letter several years after that, before he got remarried, because I had uh, understood from various communities, infrequent, but various, every time he wrote to me, because we have a daughter in common, he, he, he was blaming himself for my alcoholism. He, 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 you know, he didn't really go to Al-Anon, and he didn't understand. I felt I had to try to, at least try to clear the air, you know, but I can never fix him. So I did write him a letter a few years after that. But the biggest, the biggest, uh, the biggest thing that happened for me through amends was that I got a totally new relationship with my own mother. Because we had been head to head almost all, at least since I went into puberty, but maybe even before that. And maybe because it is, I was an alcoholic from the very start. You know, because 
but there was never, and we don't have a super, we don't have a relationship made in heaven, but it's changed, you know. It's just, it's changed, and it's changed for the better. And, uh, what can I say? I have a good relationship with my daughter today, but I do realize that's not, partly it's because of the program, but it's also because, because, because of my daughter, the way she is. Uh, she's not, and she's not the way she is because of me. She is who she is. But all she ever wanted to do, like if you ever, if any of you have children and you think that your children are never going to speak to you again or anything, I realized that all my daughter ever wanted was for me to get well. That's all she ever wanted was for me to get well and be, you know, reasonably happy. That's all, you know. And so, that's a great thing. And yeah, today I don't think I have to worry about going anywhere and being <laughs> beat up, put on a list, or anything like that. I don't think I have uh, any enemies today. And if I do, I hope they let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop there. I'll stop. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.